والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم But he knows there must be rain We always want the laughter And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to Inspirations All praises due to Allah We praise Him, we seek His aid And we ask for His forgiveness And we send peace and blessings On our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam This is a new episode of your show Inspirations As we try to travel through time We try to spend some time with the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And try to learn from his wisdom And uh, the, actually, the more time we spend with the Prophet wasallam, the easier it becomes for us to follow his example and start to see through the events and even relate these lessons that we learn to our daily life. And this is the main purpose of this show. Now, last time we said that the Prophet wasallam, uh, decided to go and make Umrah to Mecca and he marches out from Medina with 1,400 people and they make their way through to uh, just uh, the, uh, the boundaries of Mecca to the valley of Asfan, then to Hudaybiyah and they make it clear to the people of Quraysh that we did not come here to fight with you we just came, came, we came peacefully and we just want to make Umrah so don't think we came to challenge your authority or challenge your reputation we, ha- we, we have uh, none of these uh, objectives or what we want to do is just make Umrah as any human being as anybody else who would come and you won't stop them but the people of Quraysh took it from uh, a different perspective they saw that as a threat to their reputation and as a challenge and defiance to their uh, authority and to their position so they took it seriously and this is why they reacted quite arrogantly and defensively uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sends Uthman ibn Affan to them, who clarifies the message to the people of Quraysh, uh, and they keep Uthman there in order to think of a, or come to a decision, and then send it back with Uthman. The news spread, or the rumor spread, that Uthman was killed. So the Muslims gather with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Messenger sallallahu alaihi tells them that it's time to make the bay'ah here, bay'ah of defense. It's a covenant that we would defend and we will not run away just in case we engage in war now here that you should fight to death. And now Umar al-Khattab as the news came to him or the rumor reached him that uh, Uthman ibn Affan had been killed he became very angry he started getting ready for war for fighting and he said to his son Abdullah ibn Umar go and get my horse ready for me. Abdullah ibn Umar goes but instead of going because when he was just trying to get the horse ready he saw that there were many people around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umar al-Khattab had no clue about this. He wasn't aware of it. So Abdullah ibn Umar goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he sees that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells them about the bay'ah. They started giving their bay'ah to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by holding his hand. Giving his bay'ah. 1,400 people. And Abdullah ibn Umar goes among them and he gives his bay'ah. Then he goes to his father and he tells him. To, so Umar ibn al-Khattab comes and he gives his bay'ah to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the Prophet Sallallahu gives them the glad tidings. He says that none of those who gave the bay'ah of Al-Hudaybiyah and the shade of the tree will go to the hellfire. None of them. And it is said that, uh, and it remained among the companions even for a long time after even the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the people of Hudaybiyah, people who uh, gave the covenant of Al-Hudaybiyah, these were the best people among all humanity. These are the best people among humanity. And actually there was one person with them who was a hypocrite. And he did not give the Prophet ﷺ his covenant on that day. He did not shake the Prophet's hand. He refused. Actually he hid. He didn't want to do that. 
So he deprived himself of this blessing. And so the Muslims were ready to fight now. And they thought that Uthman ibn Affan had been killed. Yet the Prophet وسلم, still had hope that Uthman was still alive. So this is why after everybody finished, the Prophet وسلم, said he held his own hand and he said, this is for Uthman. So Uthman is included in the blessings that will, uh, uh, that will be showered on the, these 1,400 people. There was one of the great companions, his name was Salam ibn al-Akwa. Salam ibn al-Akwa was physically a very strong person. Salam al-Akwa gave his covenant to the Prophet ﷺ. Yet after the Prophet ﷺ finished, he looked at him and he said to him, Come on, give me bay'ah ya Salama. He said, I already gave you a message of Allah. He said, give me another time. Because the Prophet ﷺ saw in Salam al-Akwa a very strong person uh, who would do a very good job in, in, fight, in fighting. So he gave his bay'ah a second time to the Prophet ﷺ. And then a third time the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Come on, give me bay'ah again. So he gave bay'ah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the people of Quraysh realized that the Muslims, so there was something you know, wrong happened, there was something going on in the Muslim camp. So they decided to send someone to, uh, to find out what was happening and to try to reach an agreement with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So first they sent this man who came from Thaqif, from a Ta'if. One of the leaders of Thaqif, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi, they sent him to the Prophet ﷺ. He sat down and he spoke to the Prophet ﷺ. He said to him, Ya Muhammad, none among the Arabs did as, you, as you're trying to do. You come and to fight your own people in their own land. What are you trying to do? So if you, actually you will be destroyed. And if you win, you, it will be a shame on you for the rest of your life that you have come to fight your own people. The Prophet ﷺ told him that I didn't come to fight. And he said, then Urwa ibn Mas'ud said to him, but, and even though your companions, these are not real fighters, and I'm sure that if uh, a fight breaks out, all these people will just leave you or run away. So, and he described them with a bad word called awbash. They're just insignificant people. Once it gets really hot and there's, really, uh, there's real fight, these people would run away. Abu Bakr was there and he said to him, he swore at, at him actually, Abu Bakr. He dealt with him harshly and he said to him, we run away from him, we run back on our heels. And he swore, uh, Abu Bakr swore at their god, Allah. So Arul Mas'ud al he said, who's this? They told him, Abu Bakr said, I'm Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr had had a favor on Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. One time, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi was in trouble and Abu, Abu Bakr helped him. That was before they migrated from Mecca to Medina. So he said, because, you, because of your favor on, on, that you have on me, because I owe you, I won't deal with you properly now. I will leave it for another time. So he started speaking to the Prophet wasallam, telling him that what you are doing is wrong and you, uh, you will be defeated. And he started holding or touching the beard of the Prophet ﷺ as he was speaking. But there was a person from Thaqif, uh, as Urwa ibn Mas'ud uh, Thaqafi was speaking, Al-Mughira bin Shu'bah. Now Al-Mughira bin Shu'bah was the nephew of uh, Urwa ibn Mas'ud. He was the nephew, but he, he was a Muslim. He had his sword, and as Urwa ibn Mas'ud Thaqafi was holding the beard of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, his nephew hit him with the handle of the sword on his hand. He said, move your hand away from the beard of the Prophet wasallam, or I will cut it off. And obviously he had the helmet on, so he couldn't realize, recognize him. He said, who are you? He said, I am your nephew. I am, uh, you, you, I mean, you know me very well. He said, oh, okay, you still remem- do you still remember... And he reminded him of some mistakes that he did in Al-Jahiliyyah. But anyway, we don't need to get into all these details. So he realized that he wasn't, you know, these people are not playing. These people are serious about what they are doing. And the Prophet ﷺ made it clear to him that we don't, we didn't come for fight. We don't come for war. You just go back to them and tell them we have come in order just to make Umrah. So Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi goes back to the people of Quraysh and he says to them, you know, 
I have to tell you, tell you the truth. I've never seen a king. I've seen the king of the Byzantines. I've seen the kings of uh, the Persians. I've seen the kings of every nation. But I've never seen a king that, who has been held in high esteem and whose followers have so much devotion to him as the followers of Muhammad to Muhammad. I don't think you will be able to get to him. These people prefer to die before you even touch him. He said even when he makes wudu, these people take the water of his wudu and just rub it on themselves. Anything that comes out of his, of his body, even if he spits, they take that sp uh, whatever he spits, that saliva, and they rub it on their body. They love him, they honor him. I don't think you'll be able to make it to him because they would die one after the other before you even touch him. But and I see that this man has come to you with a plan of peace. And my advice would be take his plan of peace. I see so much potential for you and for him in this plan of peace. It's better for everybody. It is be it's, it's a win-win situation. So just accept it. Now, the, it seems that they didn't take this seriously. So they decided to send the leader, uh, another person called uh, Mikraz. Now, Mikraz was a very bad person. He came... And he tried to speak to the Prophet ﷺ. Or before him, they sent uh, the leader of Al-Habish, Al-Hulais, Al-Hulais ibn Al-Qama. Now as Al-Hulais was approaching the Muslims, the Prophet ﷺ said to them, this man, he honors Al-Ka'ba, and he honors the religion of Ibrahim. So show him that we have come as pilgrims, as people who are trying to make Umrah. So show him the animals, the sacrifice, al-hadi, and make the talbiyah, labbayk Allahumma labbayk, labbayk la sharika laka labbayk, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk. Say that loud so he could hear that this person honors this ritual, these rituals of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as uh, al-Hulais was coming, he saw that, he said, these people should not be turned away from Kaaba. The Kaaba, they have the right. You know, different tribes, pagans come from every uh, aspect, from every area in the Arabian Peninsula. They have the right to make Umrah and the son of Abdul Muttalib is prevented from doing that. He went back to Quraysh and he said to them, you can't do this, you can't prevent him. He came to make Umrah, these are pilgrims. You can't turn them away, this is a crime. Allah will destroy you. They said, you are just a Bedouin. We are not going to listen to you. Just sit down here. They sent a person called Mikraz. Mikraz was a very, uh, you know, uh, impolite kind of person. He was very aggressive and he spoke very bad language. So he came to speak to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ made it clear to him that we just came for Umrah. We didn't come to fight. Now at this time, a group of the Mushrikeen, some young uh, some of the youth among the people of Quraysh, they wanted to attack the Muslims. The Muslims got hold of them. They took them captives, yet the Prophet ﷺ released them. He said, just go away. And Allah referred to this in Surah Al-Fatih by saying, uh, He is the one who protected you when these people tried to attack you and He caused you to let them free. So when Quraysh saw that, they realized that Muhammad ﷺ didn't come to fight. Now this man has really come. He's serious. He came for Umrah. And this is why straight away, while Mikraz was still with the Prophet ﷺ, they sent Suhail ibn Amr. Now Suhail ibn Amr was known for his leniency. General, generally speaking, he was a diplomat, a very professional diplomat. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ, and when the Prophet ﷺ saw him, and his name Suhail is taken from the word Sahel. Sahel means easy, easy going. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw that, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has made your Whole, the whole affair easy for you as this man is sent. So Suhail ibn Amr comes to the Prophet وسلم, and he speaks to them. They have a long discussion uh, about uh, you know, the position of the Prophet وسلم, the position of Quraysh and the whole affair. They discuss it for a long time. Then they arrive at an agreement. But now Quraysh, before sending Suhail ibn Amr, they say to him, okay, you try to make a deal with Muhammad, but there is one condition we have. He doesn't make Umrah this year. We won't accept any treaty, any reconciliation, any kind of agreement that ha has within it uh, the idea or the notion that Muhammad makes Umrah this year. They were very adamant about this. Because as I said, it put their reputation at stake. So Suhail ibn Umrah came with this notion. 
And after long, a long discussion with the Prophet ﷺ, and by the way, just before he arrived, some slaves who had already believed, who were Muslims in Mecca, and they were tortured, they managed to break loose and run away, and they came and joined the Muslims. So Suhail ibn Amr, he said, you bring these people back. He said, no. The Prophet ﷺ said, no. But we give you their price, their money. And the Muslims paid their money, the, the value of these slaves, and we take them. As Muslims, they, they live with us. So uh, Suhail ibn Amr has a long discussion with the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, after a long discussion, they come up with a treaty that has many points within it. What are the points that the Prophet ﷺ agreed on with Suhail ibn Amr? But it turned out that the Prophet's guess or the Prophet's intuition that Suhail ibn Amr was sent, that inshallah this affair will be easy and it will be all right. And don't forget, the Muslims were ready now to fight because the, no news has arrived about Uthman ibn Affan. So basically, the treaty they arrived at was called Sulh al Hudaybiyah, a very famous treaty, Sulh al Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah. What does it say? It says for the first article was that there is no war for 10 years between Quraysh and the Muslims. That's it. We have no war, okay? It's a peace treaty. We have no war for 10 years. That, that was very beautiful thing, very good for the Prophet Sallallahu and even very good for Quraysh because, because Quraysh themselves, they realized they couldn't deal with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they didn't want to withdraw and take the initiative to withdraw because it would, it would seem as a sign of weakness. As it came from both sides, as I said, it was a win-win situation. It made it easy for them to accept it. Uh, so everybody is safe. We don't attack you, don't attack us. It's a, a, a treaty of peace. And anyone who comes to the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca as a Muslim, without the permission of his guardian, like he's a slave without his, the permission of his master, if he's a son, without the permission of his father, if she's a woman, uh, they didn't speak about women, they just said it, they said, any man, this wa, this, this wa, the, these were the wordings of the treaty, any man who comes to Muhammad, without the permission of his guardian from Mecca, then Muhammad should send him back. And anyone who comes from the Muslims and, is, and he leaves Islam and he decides to join Mecca, then we keep him in Mecca. He doesn't have to go back to Muhammad wasallam. And there should be no treacherousness, uh, no, heart, you know, no, no fights, nothing, no tricks, okay? Uh, no breach of this covenant between us for 10 years. And any of the tribes who would like to become an ally with Muhammad, they can do that. Any, any tribe who wants to become an ally, ally with Quraysh, they can do that. So Khuza'a became allies of Muhammad Wasallam, and Banu Bakr became allies of Quraysh. And the, this year, an article says that this year Muhammad and his companions go back to Medina, they don't perform Umrah this year, but they come next year. And they make the Umrah, the people of Quraysh go out, they evacuate Mecca for three nights, three days. When Muhammad وسلم, and his companions come and make Umrah, they stay there for three days, only with their swords, no other weapons. They make their Umrah, and then they leave three days later. So basically they agreed on this treaty, and the Muslims, what was the response of the Muslims? They were surprised, because it seemed in the favor of Quraysh. How did the Prophet ﷺ handle this? We will talk about this after this short break, so stay with us. Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? Brothers and sisters, to increase your iman. Khayrukum, man ta'allama al-Qur'ana wa'allama. Wa ratti lil-Qur'ana tartila. Learning how to recite the Qur'an properly. Learning the meaning of what we recite. Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite. Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life. We we'll listen to the participants and the guests. We'll take your phone calls. We're going to recite life. We'll listen to your recitation. And we'll correct it according to the rules and regulations which we'll state in each episode. Now, your dream Will come true. Will come true. Inna nahnu nazzalna al-zikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. Allah knows what.
what's best for us. So why should we complain? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. The life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is so powerful and the depth of his character is just so appealing to any soul that reads the life of the Prophet sallallahu with, uh, without bias, with a spirit or with an in, uh, inquisitive soul, an inquisitive mind. You'll find so many lessons in the life of the Prophet sallallahu and the, his deep insight is very powerful as we will see inshallah, especially with this treaty. Uh, now before this I will remind you to write again, send us your feedback, let us know what you expect from the show, let us know what you would like and how you, you, you think that the show could really help you uh, be practical and uh, try to apply Islam in a better fashion, in a better way in your daily life. Tell us how we can help you. Tell us how we can make it practical for you. We would like to hear from you. As well, you can log in on our uh, blog, which is www.alhamidi.wordpress.com. It's www.alhamidi.wordpress.com. Please, there will be a post, inshallah, and you can send me any posts you would like us to have there, or any comments, you can send them, inshallah, you can have, we can have discussions about certain points, and this would help us, inshallah, develop the program, and it will help you, inshallah, benefit even more, as you will go through discussions. Now, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after making this agreement, this basic agreement, is about to write it down, now they will write it down. Who was the writer? Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the Prophet ﷺ says to Ali, write down. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That's the first thing. Now Suhail ibn Amr says to the Prophet, we don't know who's ar-Rahman. We say, generally because that was the norm there in the Arabian Peninsula, we say, Bismika Allahumma. The Prophet ﷺ says, okay. Okay, because the Prophet had the deeper insight. He didn't, he didn't want to fight with these people over small details. Okay. Because the benefit that the, this treaty would bring about, the benefits were much greater than just fighting over a tiny point. Even if it's true. So the Prophet said, okay, write bismik Allahumma. Then he said, the Prophet says, this is what Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, has agreed with Suhail ibn Amr all over. Suhail ibn Amr, he says, no. No, you don't write the Messenger of Allah because if we really knew that you were the Messenger of Allah, we won't fight with you. We wouldn't have fought you. So we don't believe you are the Messenger of Allah. So write, this is what Muhammad ibn Abdullah agreed with Suhail ibn Amr over. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said to Suhail ibn Amr, I am the Messenger of Allah even if you deny it. I am the Messenger of Allah even if you deny it. But he said, okay, all right, no need to fight with you, no need to have these side battles, insignificant battles that won't change the whole thing. It's just a matter of wording, all right. It doesn't change the treaty. So he said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, okay, erase that. Erase, erase the word, the Messenger of Allah. Ali ibn Abi Talib said to the Prophet I can't do that. I can't really erase it. The Prophet said to him, okay, give it to me. And the Prophet erased it. And he wrote with his own hand, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Although the Prophet ﷺ couldn't read or write. But some scholars say this is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some scholars say that the Prophet ﷺ, because he saw his name so many times written, so he knew how to write it. But anyway, the Prophet ﷺ couldn't read or write, but he wrote it, and it's a miracle from Allah. And then he gave it to Ali ibn Abi Talib to carry on writing. This is what we agreed upon. As they were, or just before they started writing, someone called Abu Jandal. Now who is Abu Jandal? The signs of, or traces of torture were clear on his body. Who was Abu Jandal? He was the son of Suhail ibn Amr, the one who was having this meeting with the Prophet ﷺ. Now Abu Jandal had embraced Islam, but his father Suhail held him captive, he tortured him, he was trying to force him out of Islam, to denounce Islam. He refused, obviously, and he managed to break from his shackles, from the chains, and come and uh, just to uh, join the Muslim army. So the Prophet, Allah, he, when, uh, when uh, Suhail ibn Amr saw Abu Jandal, he hit him on his face, he started beating him. The Prophet said to him, okay, now we haven't 
finalized this agreement. We haven't written it down. So Abu Jandal is not included. He can join us. Suhail said, no. If you don't give him back to me, we have no agreement and I'll go back and you deal with the people of Mecca. There will be a fight. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, but we haven't finalized. He said, no, I don't do that. He said, okay, just let him be an exception. Give him to me. He said, no, we have already made the agreement. So Hal said, we've already had the agreement. The fact that we haven't written it yet, it doesn't mean that we don't have an agreement. We have an agreement. So Abu Jandal says to the Muslims, Do you, don't leave me to these mushriks. They put me to trial. They forced me out of my religion. The Prophet Wasallam says to Abu Jandal, Allah will make a way out for you. We can't break our covenant. We've just made, made the treaty. We can't break it. But Allah will make a way out for you. That's, this is glad tidings. These are glad tidings from Allah. Allah will make a way out for you. Umar ibn Khattab says, how do we leave him? He's a Muslim. He has come to us. Abu Umar al Khattab was very hot blooded. He couldn't really take that. So, uh, anyway, they finalized, they wrote down the treaty, and Abu uh, Suhail ibn Amr comes and beats his son Abu Jandal and he drags him away. Now, Umar al Khattab, unable to do anything because the treaty prevents them, he couldn't break the word of the Prophet. ﷺ. What he did, he just walked with, with his sword. Tied on his uh, waist, he came and walked next to Abu, Abu Jandal as his father was dragging him. And he said to him uh, that you can kill your father. But he didn't want to give him uh, direct help. So he was waiting for Abu Jandal just to pull the sword and kill his own father. But Abu Jandal did not do that. He didn't want to kill his father. He still had hope that his father would become a Muslim. Now Abu Jandal was taken by his father, Suhail ibn Amr. And uh, the Muslims felt really bad about this. They felt that the treaty was not in the favor, it was in the favor of Quraysh. They felt that they were wronged, that it was injustice. And they didn't really understand why the Prophet ﷺ agreed to these terms. Why did he agree to that? Why didn't you just make it equal? Anyone who comes from them to us, that's fine. Anyone who comes from us to them, that's fine. Just make it like that. The Prophet ﷺ calmed them down. He said to them, listen, it will be in our favor, inshallah. Anyone who from us decides to give up Islam and goes to them, then we don't want him. We don't need such a person who apostates. But anyone who comes from them and he wants to join us, Allah will make a way out for him. Don't worry about this. Allah will take care of these people. I am the messenger of Allah and this is, I don't do these things without revelation. The Muslims still could, because they were human beings, you know, they couldn't just really grasp the deep insight of the Prophet ﷺ, which was supported by revelation. So the companions were in a state of disappointment, frustration, bewilderment, and confusion, because they couldn't really, they thought the Prophet ﷺ had compromised so much. Although they realized. It's revelation from Allah, and he was the Prophet of Allah Wasallam. but they were still human beings. They needed time to just digest and grasp what was happening. So the, uh, the uh, Umar ibn Khattab comes to the Prophet Wasallam, says to him, O oh Messenger of Allah, aren't we upon the truth? The Messenger Wasallam says, yes. Aren't they upon falsehood? The Prophet ﷺ says, yes. He says, okay, O Messenger of Allah, why do we uh, step down? Why do we compromise? Well, we are upon the truth. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ya Umar, I am the Messenger of Allah, and I will not disobey Allah. The, the Prophet the Umar said to him, why don't we make Umrah? The Prophet ﷺ said, said to him, did I tell you, I told you, I promised you we'll make Umrah, but did I promise you that we will make it this year? He said, no. He said, okay, Umar. We'll make it next year, inshallah. I will not disobey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Umar as a human being, as a person who had so much passion and concern for Islam, he didn't know what to do. So he just went to Abu Bakr and he said, Ya Abu Bakr, aren't we upon the truth? Abu Bakr said, yes. He said, aren't they upon falsehood? They said, he said, yes. So why do we compromise? Abu Bakr said to him, listen, Ya Umar, he is the messenger of Allah. He knows what he's doing. Just hold on to what he says, and you will be right. He didn't tell you that we will make Umrah this year. So it was, these were the same words of the Prophet ﷺ. Umar al-Khattab, he couldn't settle down. He couldn't really just swallow that. 
So the Muslims now, the Prophet ﷺ tells the companions, now slaughter your sacrifice because now we have been prevented and we, ha we have the right to sacrifice and just shave our hair. Uh, the Muslims could not do that. They just couldn't do it. They couldn't make themselves do it. The Prophet Sallam tells them three times, do that. They didn't respond to him. Not that they didn't they wanted to disobey him, but they couldn't they were so frustrated, they felt down that they couldn't just go about doing that. They were they were hoping that some revelation would be revealed to the Prophet Sallam and change this whole treaty. So the Prophet Sallam was a bit annoyed by that. He went to his tent where Umm Salama was there and she said to him, you know, what's the matter? He said, I commanded them to shave their, their heads and to uh, slaughter their sacrifice. But they didn't respond. Umm Salama said to them, okay, all you have to do is just shave your hair yourself and slaughter your hadi, slaughter your sacrifice, and they would just follow suit. A wonderful advice from Umm Salama, the mother of the believers. May Allah be pleased with her. Very practical, because people, you know, uh, uh, people find it difficult to start something, but when they see someone going that way, it's easier to follow. She knew human psychology, so the Prophet ﷺ went out. He shaved his hair, and he slaughtered his sacrifice. The Muslims straight away they started shaving their heads, the hair, and slaughtering their animals. Now the, the the narration is very is very beautiful and somehow funny because the Muslims were so frustrated. It says as they were shaving their own hair, each one was shaving the hair of the other. They were about to kill themselves because of the frustration and the pain they were going through. Because they really had had high hopes they would be making they would be making Umrah. They were dreaming of going to the Kaaba and making cir uh, circumambulance, making the Tawaf. Subhanallah, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best and the Prophet ﷺ had a deeper insight. Now as they were on the way uh, back to Medina, they set out back to uh, Medina, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, Umar comes to him many times and he's still not convinced. He just wants to be convinced. Many times he asks the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ doesn't reply to him. So he says three times, I, tr I asked the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't reply to me. So I just marched I hurried, I marched uh, in front of the army and I said, I thought that Allah would reveal some verses cursing me because of me having so much argument with the Prophet ﷺ. I really felt bad about myself. I, I didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, someone calls me, one from among the Muslims. He says, Ya Umar, the Prophet ﷺ wants you. He says, I went back to the Prophet ﷺ and I thought that Allah revealed some verses Ordering me to be ordering that I should be punished. He, he said, "I realized how much I have went beyond bounds in arguing with the Prophet So uh, he goes to the Prophet, Prophet to find the Prophet smiling. The Messenger tells to him, "Abshir ya Umar, here are the glad tidings, ya Umar." The Prophet was patient with him. He realized he was a human being and all of this passion is just for Islam and for the sake of Islam. But needs to be tamed, needs to be controlled. He says to him, Allah revealed to me a surah, Surah Al-Fatih. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Allah calls this treaty a great victory. It's a victory, imagine. Amr al-Khattab says to the Prophet ﷺ, is it really a victory? The Prophet ﷺ says to him, yes, it is a victory. Allah calls it a victory. Amr al-Khattab says, I was relieved. I was, it was to me, was like a whole mountain taken out of my, uh, from my shoulders. I realized it was a victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this verse, on this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the whole situation. And the Muslims have felt, at that time, they felt really good and they felt satisfied about this whole treaty. They realized it will, it will be on their own, in their own favor. Now, after that, one of the Muslims, a Muslim woman, she, her name was Umm Kulthum. She was in Mecca and she was the daughter of Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, one of the fiercest enemies of Islam who was killed in the Battle of Badr. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, he was the person who actually, during the Meccan period, 
when the Prophet ﷺ was praying next to Al-Kaaba, he was the one who brought the intestine of a camel and he put it on the back and the shoulder of the Prophet ﷺ when he was making sujood. And the Prophet ﷺ made supplication against him. This enemy of Islam, his daughter was Muslim, Ummu Kulthum. She ran away from Mecca and she came to join people, the Muslims in Medina. People of Mecca sent to the Prophet ﷺ that you should send her back according to the treaty. The Prophet ﷺ said, no. I am not going to send her back. Because in the treaty, it says that any man that comes, it doesn't say any woman, it doesn't say anybody, it says any man. So if it says any man, Rajul, it means women are not included. So any woman that comes to us, we're not going to send her back. And we will pay you. If she had a husband who had already paid her dowry, we will give him back the dowry. But we're not going to give, to give the women back. And Allah revealed Surah Al-Mumtahina, where He instructs the Prophet and the believers how to treat the women who are coming from Mecca, how to test them and make sure that they were Muslims. And in this Surah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala commands the Muslims not to keep their non-Muslim wives. And Umar al-Khattab at that time had two wives who were non-Muslim. At that time, two wives who were non-Muslim. So Umar al-Khattab decides to divorce them. Uh, they were. Uh, uh, one of them was called Qariba, Qariba bint Umayya. Umar al-Khattab divorced her and she went back to Mecca and Muawiyah ibn Abu, Suf- Abu-, Abu Sufyan married her and there was Umayya, uh, or a woman called Ibn, she was the daughter of Jarwal al-Khuzai, a person called Jarwal al-Khuzai. Uh, she, when she went back, she married Abu Jahm. Anyway, Qariba got married to uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan later on because he was a young, uh, a young boy at that time. Now, the Muslims were not allowed to keep their Muslim wives, and any uh, the non-Muslim wives, and any uh, woman coming from Mecca to Medina, she was given safe refuge in Mecca. And this is how Quraysh accepted that, but they were not happy with it. But because the treaty didn't, didn't was in the favor, and this article was in the favor of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What happened after this treaty, and what were the outcomes of this treaty? We'll find out after the short break, inshallah. So stay tuned. Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? Earth, the human heart, greed, exploitation, hatred, all diseases of the heart. For the cure, join Huda TV every Sunday at 20 GMT for Moments for the Heart. What's best for us? So why should we complain? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. The Prophet ﷺ finalizes the treaty with the people of Quraysh and they march uh, back to Medina. And I just talked about some of the things that happened after that. But on the way back to Medina, some interesting things happened. For example, one day they were traveling through the night. And just be about let's say about two hours before night, they decided just to take some sleep. Uh, So they rest, and after Fajr, they march forward to Medina, because they were extremely tired. So they rest, they go to sleep, and the Prophet ﷺ commands Bilal to remain awake so he could wake wake them up for Fajr. Because if you just sleep one, two hours before Fajr, and you're very tired, you're exhausted, you're most likely you won't wake up for Fajr. So they left Bilal awake in order to wake them up. He actually volunteered to do that. Now Bilal was sitting, and while he was sitting, he just fell asleep. And guess what? None, waked up, woke up, none woke up for Fajr. So they actually woke up when the sun was up. They woke up. Some narrations indicate that Umar was the first one or others. They woke up, and they didn't know what to do. Because they they didn't pray Fajr, 
and the Prophet ﷺ was still sleeping. So Umar ibn Khattab, they, they didn't want to wake the Prophet ﷺ up. Because, why? Because they thought the Prophet ﷺ overslept. Not he was actually sleeping, but he was receiving revelation. Because one of the forms through which the Prophet ﷺ would receive revelation was through his sleep. So they thought he was sleeping because he was receiving revelation. So Umar al-Khattab didn't want to wake the Prophet ﷺ directly, so what did he do? He said, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله and he, 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 he was uh, speaking that, saying that loud, and his voice was very loud. So the Prophet ﷺ woke up, and they told him that none of us woke, woke up for Fajr. So he asked Bilal, what happened, ya Bilal? Bilal said, oh Messenger of Allah, it just happened to me, what happened to you? I just fell asleep, I was tired. So the Prophet ﷺ said to them, now we here, we are in a mountain, where she, or in a valley, where shaitan slept as well with us. So we have to leave. So he commanded them to march forward and they marched until they reached another area. Uh, they made wudu and they didn't have enough water. They have very little water. Just one person had a little water in a container. So the Prophet ﷺ made supplication on it and he healed the water with his hands and the water was enough for everyone to make wudu. Imagine 1,400 people at least. They were making wudu with a little container of water, just little water. And then they prayed Fajr as they would pray it at even on, on time. They just prayed Fajr uh, with, a, with loud recitation. And then they kept marching. Uh, and uh, on the way, they reached an area where they had no water left. They had no water left. And so it was only this little container of water. So the Prophet ﷺ, they, couldn't, they were thirsty, they didn't have water to drink. The Prophet ﷺ said to them, okay, bring it to me. He put his hands in the water and uh, actually water started coming out from his fingers. And this miracle is very well known. It's very well known. Water st started springing out from the fingers of the Prophet ﷺ. All of them drank, 1,400 people. That was a miracle. That was a sign for the Muslims that this is something great from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has happened to you. And then they marched forward and they had uh, as well very little food, some dates and some pieces of bread, small pieces of bread, but they didn't have enough for everybody. So the Prophet ﷺ said to them, each one who has little food, bring it to me. They put, they put it all on one cloak and the Prophet ﷺ supplicated on that and the food multiplied and all of them ate to their, uh, to their fill. So... This was another miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just to give the Muslims a clear sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. And even if you couldn't really understand what this treaty was all about and what, what the wisdom in this treaty was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And Allah will uh, inform His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about this and He will give, give him insight. So we see that now there's a turn of events. Muslims were... They never felt safe. Every, they were, as I said, they were under constant threat. This is why they found it, they had to be on their guards all the time. They had to be ready for any attack on Medina all the time. The Prophet ﷺ had to spend people to get him used all around the Arabian Peninsula all the time. And the most dangerous enemy was Quraysh because of the history, of the violent history they had against them. Now what happened with the Treaty of Al-Hudaybiyah, the Muslims started to feel safe. Now the Prophet ﷺ said that they have left me alone now, I, cannot go, I can go and approach the people. And actually most of the enmity that was uh, leveled at the Muslims or targeted at the Muslims was because of Quraysh themselves. Other tribes would attack the Muslims just to win, you know, the, uh, just to make a favor or to win some credit with Quraysh. That was their intention, most of them. Although some of them felt threatened anyway, but uh, as they had this peace with Quraysh, things were going in the right direction, things were getting more and easier for the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ said, now Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, I have more chance, more opportunity, I have safety and peace, so now I can spread the message more. We don't have to uh, channel most of our efforts and our resources to uh, protecting ourselves from Quraysh, we've done with that. Now we can direct and channel our efforts and our resources to more constructive effort in da'wah. And, and we will see, inshallah, how the number of Muslims will grow after this uh, beautiful treaty. And it tells us that 
uh, and it shows us at this time that it's not only about war it's not only about war if we manage to reach peace with people and spread Islam by means of that it is much more effective because during the two years the following two years or these two years that followed the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah or even one year more people embraced Islam than the past uh, 17 years or the, fa the past even 19 years imagine 19 years right from the receiving the revelation till the Treaty of Hudaybiyah there was a huge number of people who embraced Islam but the number of people in the year later was more greater than these 19 years and we will come to see inshallah next year that the following year as the Prophet ﷺ goes to make Umrah how many people will join him a huge number of people and it shows us that the message of Islam has reached many people as there was safety Muslims were free to travel around and send the message and give it convey it to everybody and this is why people embraced Islam and, and Muslims were recognized as a power now because if Quraysh makes a treaty with them it means they have a real weight in terms of a military strength and they are a real power now they uh, they go back uh, to Medina, as I said, some Muslim women come to uh, to Medina from Quraysh. They have embraced Islam. They have given uh, they are given safe haven. They are given protection in Medina, and they are not included in the treaty in the condition that says that they have to go back. But there is a wonderful man, a strong man from among the Muslims who were in Mecca. His name is Abu Basir. Now, Abu Basir is one of the Muslim heroes. His name is Utba ibn Usaid. Utbah ibn Usaid managed, manages to break from the chains and the shackles and he runs away to Medina. Now, Quraysh sends two people to bring him back. He's in Medina, they come to the Prophet ﷺ, they say, we have a treaty, you have to give it, hand him to us. He's been handed to them. And the Prophet ﷺ says, uh, 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 Wayla Abi Basir, it's just sort of making dua for Abu Basir. If he just had people to help him, he would make wonders. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. Abu Basir understood the message. On the way, he killed one of these two, two people, and he was about to kill the other, but the other one uh, managed to run away and get to the Prophet, and he said, my friend was killed, and this man is going to kill me. The Prophet ﷺ said, I have nothing to do with him. But Abu Basir came, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, I will get you back. So he just ran away, and he camped somewhere near the shore, or near the coast of the Red Sea. And he made wonders. So now what happened is that every Muslim, every person who embraces Islam in Mecca, he can't go and join the Muslims because he would be sent back. So what he did, he goes and joins Abu Basir. And guess who joins him? Abu Jandal, the son of Suhail ibn Amr, joins him. And they make some sort of an army or a gang, small army. And they would make some, they would actually bring Quraysh to its knees. How? Inshallah, we will try to talk about this next week when we meet. So you are all invited to join us. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us. So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirit.